Welcome to another episode of The Crafting, Crafting Slab. This is episode four, and we're going to be talking about... Uh, we're going to be doing the case of Mary Bell, the child killer. And this week we've done a little, something a little bit different for the craft. We've actually got a hobby craft kit for, oh, you can see that, for to make a macrame vase. We, or macrame, macrame. And um, this is actually rated expert. And as we've said before, we're no experts, but we want to see if this kit, which was priced at 13 pounds, is worth the money. And if it's actually something that anybody can do at home, which they do advertise. So let's get started. Exciting. Yeah, let's go. Okay, so these are the things that you need to get started. You will need the, the kit itself, which has the instrument out on the side, which is, I don't think is that particularly helpful. It'd be nice to have something, you know, written out. Um, and it's got the examples of the knots, if you can see, how to do the gathering knot, square knot, spiral stitch and overhand knots. So it shows you exactly how to do those on the side. The kit comes with the, yarn, the uh, macrame yarn um, and it comes with four beads, you can see on the front. This is how it's going to look with the four beads here. Uh, and you need a pair of scissors and a tape measure and then you need to pick your size of bowl. So originally we were going to do it in this large nice bowl but then we realised it's probably not going to be that big so we're just going to do it in a smaller one like this. That will look nice with the colour. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cut our yarn to length. We're going to cut four three metre lengths and one thirty centimetre length and if Danielle, do you want to start talking about the case? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this is the case of Mary Bell, who was a child killer. Uh, when you think of a what child killer, when someone says that, you think, oh, they've killed children. And while she did, this is more the fact that she was a child herself when she um, murdered the children. So. Mary Flora Bell was born in Newcastle in England in 1957. And by the age of just 11, she had murdered twice. The first murder happened on the 25th of May, 1968. Martin Brown was only four years old when he was killed in an abandoned house in the Scotswood area of Newcastle. Although it was later found that Mary had killed Martin, no cause of death was confirmed at his autopsy, and it was decided that he had died from natural causes. So where was he found? In an abandoned house? He was, so he was four years old, he was found in an abandoned house. And he had died of natural causes. And said he died of natural causes, oh. um, but it was rumoured that there were like empty pill bottles, so oh, he'd taken drugs or somebody had given him drugs. Oh God. After this first murder, Mary Bell and her friend, Norma Bell, who wasn't a relation, they just shared the same surname, um, and who was a couple of years older than Mary, broke into a nursery in Scotswood. They vandalised the nursery and left notes. Uh, the first note said, we did murder Martin Brown, fuck off you bastard. Mm -hmm. Another note, note said, I murder so that I may come back. Uh, there's another that said, fuck off, we murder, watch out, Fanny and Faggot. And another that said, you are mice, why? Because we murder Martin Go Brown, you bet. Look out, there are murders about by Fanny and Faggot, you screws. <laughs> uh, so the notes were very badly written with spelling mistakes and a lot of it just didn't make any sense. Uh, remind me how this girl was? So Mary Bell was 11. Oh. And Norma Bell was a couple of years older than her. Oh. Um, but it was said that Mary Bell was the much more dominant one. And um, they thought that Norma Bell had some learning difficulties. Um, so, yeah, so the police didn't look any further into it. And they just put that down as a childish prank. No. The second murder happened on the 31st of July, 1968. So a couple of months after Martin had been murdered, Brian Howe was only three years old when Mary Bell strangled him to death. And as if that wasn't enough, her and Norma had used a razor blade to mark the letter M to the boy's stomach, 
you know, used scissors to cut his legs, mutilate his genitals, and cut some of his hair. Oh my goodness. Following on from this is <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, not nice. No. Following on from what makes it worse though is the fact that these girls are so young and yeah. doing these kind of things. Yeah. But yet old enough that they should know not no to better. do things like this. Uh, following on from Brian's death, the police launched a large-scale manhunt for the killer. Mary and Norman, Norma sorry, were both questioned by detectives as they had been seen playing with Brian on the day he was murdered. It was noted how calm Mary was when questioned and upon further questioning she gave details of an eight-year-old boy who had been playing with Brian and he had a small pair of broken scissors which she used to try and cut off a cat's tail. So she's, she's um, so quite, quite good at lying at the age of yeah. to, to make the police not but, suspect her. But actually there, there was a boy who'd been in the area and he had told the police that he'd seen Mary and Norma with the boy. Right. So um, instead of Mary saying that she'd seen this boy with broken scissors, instead of throwing the detectives off the scent, uh, this actually gave the opposite effect, and the detectives now believe Mary to be the murderer. Okay. A few days later, Norma Bell confessed to the police that she knew about the murder of Brian Howe. And during this initial confession, Norma said Mary had taken Norma to Brian's dead body, and Mary had told Norma she had enjoyed strangling him and then scoring marks on his stomach with a razor blade. Oh. Norma was able to show the police where the razor blade had been hidden and draw the wounds that had been carved on Brian's stomach. So they knew that she was telling the truth yeah. or they knew that she knew about the body at least. Yeah. So just for the craft, I'm now uh, just really, wow, changing the subject. <laughs> I'm just uh, lining up the, the strings into through, through the hoop, going, half, so going halfway through the strings and I'm gonna start as per the instructions on the side, doing a spiral knot on so it's separating them into four groups of four strands and do it starting on the spiral knots. It already yeah. sounds complicated. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's not that easy. I mean, I think expert is probably the way to describe it because I struggled measuring three meters, so pretty much yeah. beginner. Um so yeah, I'll just I'll just uh, start figuring that out and we'll go back to the story. Okay. So after uh, Norma told the police that Mary had murdered um, Brian Howe, uh, she then admitted in the state of the following day to being there when Mary had strangled Brian. And fibres discovered on Brian's body matched the clothing worn by both Mary and Norma, and grey fibres from Mary's dress were also found on the body of Martin Brown, linking both of the murders. On the 7th of August 1968, both girls were formally charged with the murder of Brian Howe and the trial began on the 5th of December that year. Both girls had psychological evaluations and during the trial it was detailed how Norma was intellectually delayed and submissive, whereas Mary suffered from a psychopathic personality disorder. So them saying that she was the Ring leader was probably quite true. Yeah, I think in um, other cases that, like um, the James Bolger, Bolger, is that the yeah, name? James Bolger case, um, people often said with that that one of them was the more dominant one and the other was just going along. With yeah, it. I think with these things that perhaps happens quite a lot. And in yeah. this case, Mary, although she was younger, was the more dominant one. Norma was the submissive one who went along with it. Both Mary and Norma pleaded not guilty to the charges, and despite both defence teams wanting anonymity for the girls because of their age, the judge refused, and so the media were allowed to publish the names, ages, and photographs of both girls, even though they were only 11. That's quite shocking. But I wonder if that, again, with the... Um... The, with John Venables and Robert Thompson, whether that was where their names were published mm -hmm. as well, because there was precedent with this case. Yeah, it could be. Could be. 
Both girls testified for their own defences and both continued to blame the other one, each saying it had been the other who had carried out the murders and they were just watching out of fear. Mm -hmm. Mary's testimony in court lasted nearly four hours and at one point the court had to be adjourned because Mary began crying inconsolably. Although it was noted throughout the trial, Mary was very emotionless and didn't seem to show remorse, apart from when she had this over-the-top crying episode. The court heard from Norma's defence that the only evidence against her was Mary's accusations, and Mary's defence team talked about her broken family background and the testimony of a doctor who had described Mary as having retarded development of the mind. It's not the same that we've done it. No, it's not very... <laughs> It wouldn't be considered very kind. And um, that the notes in the nursery only proved that the crimes were a childish fantasy and not ones that they carried out. But the court then went on to hear from the prosecution about how Mary was the more domineering of the two, despite her being two years younger, and that Norma was considered of a subnormal intelligence. That's their words, not mine. <laughs> Uh, the jury took three hours and 25 minutes to reach their verdict. Mary Bell was found guilty of manslaughter and not murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility. However, Norma Bell was acquitted of all charges. Wow. So um, she walked free. She was very happy, they said, in the courtroom, punching the air. All her family were all around her, um, whereas Mary Bell was in tears. The problem then was where to put Mary, as at the time there wasn't facilities set up for an eight-year-old girl who had killed two young boys. She was first put in a remand home and then moved to Red Bank Special Unit, which was a young offenders institute, um, which, talking about the James Bulger, Clay, oh, I say, Bulger. Bulger case, um, it was also where they sent John Venables, who was one of his murderers. At the time Mary was there, she was the only female inmate. And in 1973, at the age of 16, she was moved to a prison. And then in 1976, she was transferred to an open prison, which was much less secure and inmates were given more freedom. However, this wasn't a good thing as Mary escaped from the prison. Wow. And her and another in escaped inmate spent a few days with two young men. <gasps> Um, apparently, this was, um, Mary wanted this as an opportunity to lose her virginity. So obviously she'd uh, gone in when she was 11 years yeah. old, so, so young. Um, but a few days later, Mary was caught and sent back to the open prison, where her punishment for escaping was she lost her privileges for 28 days. Oh, wow. So not not the not, fact that... Not really a, a punishment. No, and not... Um, also, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's any information about whether she was remorseful or she ended up taking responsibility for her actions. But, I, I mean, I assume she, there was if she was moved to an open prison. But... Um, uh, well, I mean, I think this, uh, this open prison was... It didn't have a lot of strict rules like you'd expect yeah. a prison to have. But also, she, you know, she is a, a murderer. Yeah. And if she was, it's a good job that when she was out, all she wanted to do was lose her virginity. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, at this stage, perhaps she'd been rehabilitated in some yeah. way. Um, and in 1979, Mary was moved to another open category prison in preparation for her release, which happened in 1980 at the age of 23. Oh, wow. So Mary had served almost 12 years for the manslaughter of Brian Martin Brown and Brian Howe. Wow. Okay, so this is what it should look like when you've done the, the first of the 25 spiral knots. Now we have to do that for the other three sections of four knots. So we're just going to do that off camera because it has taken quite a long time and then we'll get back to the story. Just to finish off the last two stitches for the spiral stitch, we pass one strand in front, one strand in the back and cross it over the front. 
pull it, pull the other one through the loop so it crosses over, pull it tight, and then you're always working in the same direction. Plus one over the front, one over the back and through the loop, and this one through the loop, and pull. And then it will automatically spiral around. So when you've got your four sides done, it should look a little bit like this. It's looking good already. It's taken about half an hour, I think, to get to yeah, this point. Yeah. So, so far, so good for the kit. It was a bit of a struggle to start, but so far, so good. So the next step is to tie a square knot five centimetres under the spiral knot on each of these sides. So while I'm doing that, again, the square knot is written in the instructions on the side of the pack. So while I'm doing that, we'll continue with Yep. So um, as I was saying, Mary was released from prison in 1980 at 23 after serving nearly 12 years for the manslaughter of Brian and Martin. Mary was given an anonymity and started a new life. After her release, Mary became pregnant and in 1984 gave birth to her daughter. Obviously, there were concerns about a child murderer having a child of her own. Yeah, I would, I would think that that's probably not such a good idea. No, no. But, but Mary fought to keep her daughter and she managed to get custody of her daughter, who was also given anonymity originally until she was the age of 18. Right. And then it would end for her daughter. Right. Um, but when uh, Mary's daughter was 14 in 1998, reporters discovered where Mary lived and they both had to leave their home and be re relocated to another part of the country. And until this happened, Mary's daughter knew nothing of Mary's past. Wow. So that there's is. this big shock of my mum killed these boys and you're going to have to change your whole life and your name and everything. Yeah. Again. Um, Mary, following this, then applied to have her daughter's anonymity changed from until she was 18 to a lifelong one. Because obviously, once she turned 18, if everyone knew who she was, then yeah. the press would just have her. So the daughter, so, so, uh, did she achieve that? Did she get her anonymity? Because the, you know, the last thing the daughter would want, or uh, hopefully Mary would want for her daughter, is to, you know, to go her entire life with the stigma of being well of absolutely murder. i mean and it's it's obviously not her daughter's fault yeah what, what mary did and certainly if she never told her that's yeah that's i mean i don't i don't even know how you would start a conversation like that so um mary was successful and the courts did grant her daughter lifelong anonymity and also her daughter then went on to have her own baby and so Mary's granddaughter has now been granted the lifelong anonymity. That's good. Because, you know, like we said, it's, it's not their not fault, their fault, but, you know, the British press would absolutely oh, handle them. Um, I remember that there was a documentary recently about the daughter of the BTK killer, Dennis Rader. And then um, when she discovered, you know, she, she, when her father was discovered, sorry, she was already um i don't know if she was an older teenager or if she was an adult so she knew everything about what was going on and then obviously she was talented because of it and the eventually she came out and, and spoke about it and said you know none of this was my fault you know i'm, I'm yes i am the child of a murderer but that doesn't make me a murderer and i think the people that suffer the most you know no, that's not true. Not not the people that suffer the most, but but some of the people that they suffer do the most suffer are yeah. the, the the families of these people. Yeah. So, so after we've done the four square knots, probs they're probably not exactly five centimeters, but I'm going for the uh, shabby chic five, the rustic look, the rustic look, and that's what I'm. That's the story I'm sticking with. So now you have to somehow thread all of the threads for each group through one bead okay it is possible um if you 
With a bit of determination. Yeah, with a bit of determination. So one of the other tools you're going to need is some kind of foreseeing implement. <laughs> Who would have thought this would take the longest? Put the bead on, yeah, and the weight, the, the thickness of the thread keeps the bead up. And yeah, just a regular knot underneath this, the bead. This. Okay, so it's say about 10 centimeters under the. Mm. Yeah. Tie an overhand knot approximately 10 centimeters under the square knot. Yeah. So, the square, so this is the spiral knot. Yeah. This is the square knot underneath. Yeah. And then about 10 centimeters under that, we just tie a regular knot. Two strands on one side, two strands on the other side. Okay. Simple. So while, while I'm in pain in my hand, do you want to continue? Yes, I do. Okay, so now um, I've talked about Mary's crimes and her life afterwards. I thought we'd now uh, discuss Mary's life and the events leading up to the murders. And then it'd be really good to hear your thoughts on Mary and if you think she is the psychopathic monster she was made out to be or not. So Mary's mother, Betty, was a prostitute and had Mary when she was 17 years old. She made it obvious from the start that she didn't want Mary. And it was reported that when Mary was born and the nurses tried to hand Mary to Betty, Betty shouted, get that thing away from me. Um, Mary's biological father was unknown, but the father figure in her life was William Bell, who was a career thief. So, good start yeah. so far. Mary and her siblings were often left alone, and Betty, on occasions, tried to give her daughter away and made up lies about her being hurt or killed. Oh. There's also reports of child abuse with Betty dropping her daughter out of a window, her baby daughter out of a window and giving her sleeping pills. Mary had also talked about her mother as a prostitute, allowing her clients to abuse Mary, although this has never been confirmed and uh, Mary's siblings said that they didn't know about any of this. So this is um, Mary's work. That's incredibly shocking. I mean, I, obviously, no, no child should ever go through yeah. an upbringing like that. It doesn't, you know, I always say in these situations, it, it doesn't excuse it, but it might explain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, there's various stories of physical and mental abuse, abuse that Mary suffered at the hands of her mother. And even later, when Mary was in the remand unit, the staff there didn't like Betty and said that she was manipulative and that Mary's behaviour changed each time Betty visited her. So even when she was older and in prison. So her mother was very visiting nice. her, even though her mother, you know, she, she made all these efforts to get rid of her as a child. And well, then she was visiting her. That seems very odd. Betty, Mary's mother, also sold her story to the press and use it as an opportunity to make money from what Mary had done, encouraging her daughter to write letters from prison so she could hand them over to the tabloids for money. Um, so that's a brief outline of what Betty, Mary's mother, was like. Um, and if you want to do a bit of further investigation, you'll see that she really was a horrible woman. So with a start like that, obviously, yeah. you know, like I say, it doesn't excuse what she did. No. But, I mean, how could anyone end up normal with that kind of it, it was upbringing. it was a horrible start yeah. for Mary. Um, and during this time in 1968 where Mary lived was considered very poor and deprived areas there are lots of derelict houses which were due to be demolished um, and it was considered normal at this time for young children to be playing out during all hours unsupervised um, which just wouldn't happen nowadays you know you wouldn't let your three or four year old play in a abandoned house no that, that was what was surprising to me, i think most surprising to me and and it seems to be a common theme in in cases um where where children are left alone or yeah like you say they're out playing 
in abandoned houses at all hours. Yeah. And next, we're going to take two strands from group from one of the groups and two strands from the other group, and we're going to start tying them together in a square knot. This. And this is the part where we tie the groups together. Is this where it starts to get complicated? Um, or is it all, all been complicated? I time? really, really sincerely hope not, because I don't think I want to do macrame anymore. <laughs> it's, it's enjoyable, but the hobby craft are certainly telling the truth when, if expert report means the amount of patience that you require, then yes, you certainly need expert level. There we go. Then we take the next two strands and we repeat with the next group. Before the murder of Martin and Brian, there were other violent assaults. A three-year-old boy was found dazed and bleeding and told, Mary, told police that Mary and Norma had pushed him off the roof of an air raid shelter. Another Why allegation. Why is the child playing on the roof of an air raid shelter? Um, I think uh, Mary and Norma had taken him oh, on the roof. Okay. Um, I mean, the question nowadays is why is a three year old boy out playing on his own? That's true. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think from reading about it, Mary and Norma had taken him on the roof of the air raid shelter and pushed him off. Uh, another allegation was made to police that Mary and Norma had tried to strangle their children in a sand pit with the alleged victim claiming in the later interview that Mary had held her down and poured sand down her throat. <gasps> wow. As well as trying to strangle them. Uh, Mary denied that she had done either of these assaults and the girls were just given warnings. Mary was known to be violent among the other children in her school and she wrote about Martin's death at school after it had happened, um, but this wasn't picked up by any of the teachers. Um, it was kind of like um, a diary entry that she'd written in that kind of style about it. I've, I've had a shocked expression on my face for, for all of this story yeah. so far. So this, this the, the incident with the three-year-old boy to the air raid shelter and the sand pit, this was all before she'd murdered. So these were things that perhaps could have been picked up on. Yeah. Um, in 1998, a very controversial book was written by Gita Sereni, I think you'd say her name, um, about Mary Bell, called Cries Unheard. Uh, it was um, her second book about Mary Bell, so she'd written an earlier one about the crimes, and mm -hmm. she was actually in the courtroom. Wow. They'd written a book about it, and then later on she wrote, in 1998, she wrote um, this book called Cries Unheard. The reason the book was controversial was because Gita shared the publishing fee for the book with Mary Bell, meaning that Mary got paid £50,000 to talk about how she murdered the two little boys. Wow. That, yeah, that is incredibly shocking. Obviously, you wouldn't want anyone to profit off, off such a terrible crime. Yeah, well... There was outrage from the public about the murder and apparently from politicians at the time. Um, Tony Blair was the Prime Minister, he spoke about it. But I, but I think that in America, correct me if I'm wrong, that's probably something that happens quite often because I know John Wayne Gacy, the clown killer, mm. he was selling his artwork from prison. Yeah. So I think maybe where it's quite shocking in the UK, it's probably yeah. something that does happen in the US. I think what made this more shocking is the fact that the book was obviously about Mary and her murders. And so it was like, it was as if she was getting paid for doing the murders. Yeah. So in the book, it claims that uh, society and Mary's upbringing was to blame for Mary's actions. And while controversial, the book is received, has received some good reviews 
and it's used by professionals working with problem children. Um, so um, Geeta is like, she's a renowned journalist and writer and, you know, the book is very good, but um, also Mary got paid fifty thousand yeah. pounds for doing it. So well, unfortunately, I suppose in that situation, well, I'm, I'm just tying the bottom together now. So where the bottom of the pot would be, I'm just tying it together in however way I can tie it, because unfortunately I mismeasured and I'm left with some long bits and some short bits, as you can see. So I didn't measure those very well. But uh, it, it will all look fine once it's all tied together. Um, yeah, unfortunately, in order to get into the mind of someone like that, it, the reality might be that you do have to pay them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, now you know a little bit about Mary's background, I'm interested to know if you think that Mary Bell is a monster who kills, or was she a product of her terrible life and her surroundings? Do you want to know what I think? Yeah, I'd like to know what you think. <laughs> Obviously, you want to know what I think. I'm just cutting them all to the same length. I say cutting, I'm hacking because I am, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bit frustrated now to the point that Danielle's lovely husband has just bought us a, a glass of wine. So, cheers, everyone. Um, I think that it's both. I think it's part nature and part nurture yeah. i think not everybody who was who in mary's position would have done the things that she did but i don't think she had a, a, a tidy position to do those these horrible things, things yeah. and her horrible mother and her uh, not her nice surroundings contributed yeah. to it definitely so she's she's a product of her her genes, if you like, and also her. But um, Gita actually went as far as to say that she shouldn't have been brought to trial at all. Oh, because she, she doesn't think that um, Mary is to blame because of you know what happened to her with her upbringing. I think that's. I, I mean, I'm, I'm no child psychologist, but I, I think that's an overly simplistic view. I think that, I mean, if you take, for example, if someone's getting divorced, their children at age 11 are considered to have, you know, feelings and wishes. So they're allowed to speak as, as to which parent they would like to live with. And they, they speak in custody hearings in the UK. This happened, obviously, it was a long time ago. But I, I do think by 11, children do have a, a decent moral idea of right and wrong. And you can't entirely blame the upbringing. Otherwise, all children who had a terrible start in life would be psychopathic child murderers. And if Mary hadn't have been stopped and hadn't been sent to um, the uh, prison and yes. the other unit she was put into, would she have carried on? Exactly. Normal? Or did they actually help her? Yeah, um, help her to, to be able to have a more normal life when she got out. Because like you say, she was only 23 when she got out. So it, from, from what it seems, she was able to have a somewhat normal life afterwards. And from what I was reading, I think she was really helped when she went to um, the Red Bank Special Unit, the Young Offenders Institute. I think they really did try and help her they had um you know fairly strict rules there but they were there to try and reform the children yeah that went there and I, I think that that was a good place for her to to go to yeah and if anything it got her away from her horrible mother <laughs> exactly okay so uh what are you doing now Becky? Uh, I'm just doing like noodles I'm at the just, end yeah I'm just making some noodles at the end I'm trying to tidy up the noodles as best I can to hide the fact that I measured it wrong in the first place. So it's all a bit, uh, you know, fly by the seat of my pants here. And I'm hoping that when we do the big reveal, it, it will be halfway decent. I'm thinking not. <laughs> once completed, you should have something that looks something like this. 
How I, great does that I look? honestly cannot imagine how from a sea of spaghetti you could actually make this. I can't understand how it turned from spaghetti into this, if I'm perfectly honest. Yeah, and but it looks quite good, and I think maybe it needs a bigger pot. But I'm maybe we should have gone with that one. To be honest. But when we um pause the filming to do a bit, I, I tried to help Becky and I, I couldn't do it. It's it, far too complicated it, for me. It really is time consuming yeah. and um and the wine helps. But when when hobby crafts say expert, you you certainly you need a lot of time to be able to do something like this. I think you probably could get some really good videos on YouTube for how to complete it. Probably once you've done a couple and you can just buy the string from, yeah. or the yarn from Hobbycraft and you don't need the kit and you yeah. can just get on with making it yourself. Yeah. And I know there are different ways of doing it. So I know one of the knots in particular where it gathers at the bottom, I didn't do that right, but I couldn't figure out a better way to do it. It still looks good. good. I think it fits like a bigger bowl would fit inside. Oh, there we go. Oh, it does. So you can. Oh, that actually oh. looks better. Something bigger might hide the flaws. I'm quite <laughs> impressed with that. That was just my dog in the shop. <laughs> I was wondering what that yes. means is. So thank you so much for joining yes. us today. We hope you enjoyed uh, hearing about Mary and Belle. Yes, it's and definitely an interesting story. And learning about Leo. this. <laughs> this is. Um, have any comments if you have anything about the case <laughs> or about the craft thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next time bye, bye.